Howdy everyone, welcome to another lecture on thirds. Today, the topics we are exploring are third ownership and messaging between thirds. First, a little bit of review. So conceptually, thirds are sets of code that can run in parallel to each other. In Rust, each thread is associated with a function or a closure. For the purpose of this lecture, uh, functions and closures associated with threads will be referred to as just threads. When you launch a Rust program, the main thread associated with the main function is created and launched by default. You can create additional threads using thread colon colon spawn. And here's a, uh, an example of third, a spawning third that we covered in the last lecture. We also have the concept of a blocking function. These are functions that block the current third until some condition is satisfied. For example, we might have a function that block the current third until another third finishes. Then we have the Join handle, this is, this is a struct that gives us permission to join another thread, meaning we wait for it to finish. An instance of this struct is created when you is returned by when you call the thread color clone spawn function. And then this struct has a join method. This is a blocking function that blocks the current thread until the thread associated with the handle finishes. So this condition, uh, so the, the condition for the blocking function in this case is the associated thread finish. This method returns a result, either an OK variant that contains the thread's return value, or an error variant if the thread panics. And here is an example of joining, of spawning and joining thread, where we spawn a thread associated with the second thread function, and do some work in the main thread, and then wait for that other thread to finish. We also introduce you to a pattern for in parallelism called the map reduce pattern. There are three steps to this pattern. The first step is splitting up the computation into different parts. For example, when calculating a uh, your user's ages, we you might want to split your users into different groups. And then the second stage is creating parallel running threads to perform the computation at the same time. This is called the map stage. For example, you might create threads to calculate ages for each user group. And then the, at the last step, you combine the results. This is called the reduce step. An example might be combining the user ages that you calculated earlier into a single vector. In the last lecture, we also established that thirds must never take or capture references, but always need to be an owned value. If the third is associated with a named function, the function input must always be an owned value. And if it's a closure, we need to use move to force move ownership or to force a move for ownership or a copy, not a clone, a copy of captured data into the closure. So why exactly do we need this? So first, let's look at a, an owner, a, a model of the map reduce pattern. So in the main thread, we have a, some shared data. In this case, a variable V that is a vector of some type T. And then we create three threads to do to perform our work. For each of these threads, we give them a, a slice that is a, is an immutable reference to the variable v in the main thread. And then these three threads perform some calculation. The main thread then combine the results and put out the final result. So why exactly is this model bucky? Well, uh, threads have re really have no guarantee of execution order. So they can execute in any order. One possible order we might have is a very nice order where all threads execute in parallel. They start and they stop at the pretty much the same time. And so any references that one thread how to variables in another thread will remain valid. Another possible execution order we may have where the where thread one 
starts somewhere halfway through the main thread and continue even after the main thread is finished. Or if after the main thread has dropped all its variables. And then the third two starts halfway through third one and continue even after third one finishes. We may have there's another execution execution order where the third one starts right at the end of the main thread, and then third two starts right at the end of third one. We may have another execution order where all of these three threads have a uh, call blocking functions some somewhere when you're uh, around the execution order. And so we hear the main thread blocks uh, call a blocking function and then blocks while uh, the other threads are doing work. And then uh, thread one here blocks while thread two is doing work and both of these thread blo block while thread two is doing work. We may have this execution order where thread two starts halfway through the main thread and then thread one starts halfway through thread two. And yet another possible execution order where again all these three threads call blocking functions somewhere where while they're executing. And we have a, a very messy execution order here. So uh why why is the fact that threads have no guarantee of execution order actually lead, lead to safety issues? So let's look at the map reduce example we from earlier. Here the main thread has the variable v that is the vector. And then thread one both thread one and thread two have references to v. So imagine that the first thread um kind of stops and then drop v uh right near before this finish and then while thread one is still executing. So after the main thread drops v, the reference that thread one holds to v is no longer valid. So it is a reference to nothing since, since we already had dropped. And by the time thread two actually begins executing, its reference to V is also no longer valid because V is no longer there. It's, it got dropped a while ago. And in this second execution order, again, we have a similar situation where by the time thread one starts, V is already dropped. And so V rep is not a valid reference. The same thing for V rep in thread two where it's also a not a valid reference because V no longer exists. And so in both of these instances, uh, the references to V all become invalid at some point. So this actually violates the Rust model checker rules because in Rust, references must always be valid. And so, the and so Rust, how Rust handles this is that it requires that trust must always own the values passed into it, passed into them. You cannot pass references into into trust because Rust doesn't make any guarantee about whether those references will be will remain valid. So a third closure must uh you must have use a move keyword to move stuff into it and a third function you must uh, have the input be an owned value. So the takeaway here is that we must give each thread its own data. So here we have a revised and actually correct version of the map reduce model we see from earlier. Here, instead of just giving each thread its, uh, its reference to V uh, as we did earlier, we actually give them owned value. So what happens here is that when we split the original value that is v here, instead of, instead of just passing the references into this trust, we first convert them into old values. In the case of a slice, we can call two underscore vec to convert them into actual into old vectors. And then each of these trusts will have vectors, old values, instead of references. And old values never become invalid, unlike references. So we are safe. And um yeah, we see we uh, we look at the example from earlier again. Except uh this time both thread one and thread two have V news that are owned values that are copied from V. So when the variable V in the method gets dropped, 
both uh, VNU in uh, both of the VNUs in Category One and Category Two are still valid because their own values, not references. And the same thing for a second execution order here. When V gets dropped, both of the VNUs are still valid because they are owned, they are not references. So here, nothing bad happens because everything follow Rust model checker rules. And uh, here in this uh, second execution order, both of the third, both of the third ones and third tools copy of the data goes out of scope, and nothing bad happens. We obey Rust borrowing rules by just cop giving each third its own copy of the data instead of references. And here is another example of an example of the code we saw from last lecture. You are studying the, that concept. Where in this code we try we spawn ten thirds and print out the numbers from one to ten, and here, since the uh, closure only print out the value i, it um it captures i by reference, which is not what we want, which is not what Rust allows, and so we use a move keyword to force a copy of i into the closure, and so we are good since each thread has its own copy of this uh actually tools instead of, instead of references. So, uh, as we mentioned in the last lecture, we saw an example of the map reduce pattern where we calculate ages for our customers. So the, again, we have the map stage where we split customers into a group and calculate ages and the reduce stage where we join the trust and then gather the ages into a big web. And this is a code for that example if you want to look at it. Now, it, uh, in, in the last lecture, how we handle the reduce stage was, was great for each third to finish, and then we enjoy the result. But in performance critical systems, waiting for thirds to finish before getting the result might be wasteful because our trust may do some other work before they actually return. And so we have to wait, also wait for those other work too. What if we want trust to send results back right away before they return? We want them to be able to communicate with the main trust somehow, right? So for communication between trust, we can either use shared memory, create some bit of shared memory between them. This can be very hard to get right or we can pass messages between threads. In Rust, we can pass messages by using MPSC channels. MPSC meaning multiple producer and single consumer. So what exactly is the MPSC pattern? So imagine your mailbox. You may have one or a lot of mail senders to the mailbox. So here we have multiple producers of mails and the mailbox is the single place where you receive where you will receive your mails. So here the mailbox can be thought of as a single consumer of your mails. So that's why we have the term multiple producer, single consumer. We have multiple producers, that is a mail senders, and single consumer that is your mailbox. Trust can also send data in a similar manner. We have one third. We call them the consumer that holds a mailbox that other trusts can send data to. And then this other trust will send data to the consumer's mailbox. And then the consumer trust can check its mailbox for data sent by other trusts, just as if uh, it, were, it were you and you are checking the, the dorm or apartment's mailbox. Here is a, a graphical example of how that works. We have a consumer trust and trust one and trust two. Trade one at some point send the message one, and uh, after some time the consumer third check the mailbox and they receive the message one. At some point third two, uh, some point after that third two sends the message two, and after afterward the consumer third check the mailbox and they receive two. <laughs> How does this pattern work out in Rust? Well, uh, we can achieve this pattern using the structs. MPSC column column sender and MPSC column column receiver. We can think of the sender as a as the address to the mailbox, 
and the receiver as the actual mailbox. Uh, these two the instances of these structs are created when you call the function NPSC called cron channel, which opens up the communication channel between the address and the mailbox, or between the sender and the receiver. <laughs> so in the code here, you, you can see that uh, on this slide, we call NPSC cron cron channel, and then it returns a tuple of a sender and a receiver. And here's the message is a, is a string. <laughs> You can call the method dot send on the sender to send a message using the address. So, uh, yeah, and then we can also call the function receive on the receiver to receive a message from the mailbox. So, here we spawn the thread and then we move the address into the thread so that thread can send a message. And then from the new thread we have, we call the method send. Send we send the message head on there. And in the main thread, we call, we still have the mailbox that is the receiver, the variable ix here. Okay. And then we call the method receive on ix. So we, uh, so here we check the mailbox to see if there's any messages. Do note that the function, the method dot uh, receive on the receiver is a blocking function. So it blocks the current thread until a value is received. So here, when we call ice don't receive, the main thread is actually blocked until the other thread actually uh, send this message successfully. <laughs> and then do note that, that uh, in we will use the uh, variable names t, tx, and ice a lot, a lot to refer to the senders and receivers because they are short for transmitters and receivers. Let's look at that example in code. So here's an example here where we spawn a new thread and then we move the sender, the address into it. And then uh, and then we within the thread, we send the, a message using the address by calling the method .send. And in the main thread, we try to receive a message. We wait until we receive a message using ice.receive. And then after we got the message, we print it out. Now let's actually run it and see what happens. Do note that we always get the message, even though we never joined uh, this thread in the first place. It's because since uh, the function, the method.reg is a blocking function, it actually blocks until this uh, message is sent. And so by the time we receive the message and uh, in assigned to the variable message, the, this thread will have uh, executed all its useful code and we don't no longer need to care if it's joined or not. And so we always uh this this code will always print out main thread promises hello there because the main thread always get its messages. And that's about it for today. Next lecture we will look at some advanced patterns with NPSC and how you can send um, multiple multiple messages to a single consumer from multiple messages from multiple trusts. So the multiple producers part in APSC.